I think just we have to be smart. Too many photographers only see themselves as an artist and not and and find no art in business. But there's so much creativity in business, they just can't flick the switch. Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Photo Pros Weekly. I'm Brandon Heiss and I'm joined with Olivia Tuttle again. And this week we've got a really special guest, Jerry Guionis. Jerry is a wedding photographer, and as you'll find out here soon enough, he does a lot more than just weddings. He does a lot of portraits with and without clothing. We'll get into that a little bit later. <laughs> but welcome, Jerry. How are you doing, my friend? Good, mate. Great to connect. Yeah, always, uh, always a pleasure catching up with you guys. Always a pleasure to to see you. And unfortunately, we haven't seen each other, you know, too much in the past year. But it's always, you know, technology has made it possible for us to connect. So. Um, Jerry, Absolutely. for those that don't know you, uh, tell everybody a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so um, I'm Jerry Guionis, and thank you for pronouncing my, my last name correctly because it's been butchered over the years, so thank you for that. Um, but Australian-born um, photographer in Melbourne, born and raised in Melbourne, Australia, uh, Greek background. I now live mostly in the U.S., in Las Vegas. I've been photographing for professionally for 27 years, and I've been teaching for 20 and uh, I'm also the inventor of the Ice Light. I'm a Nikon ambassador uh, and involved in many, many, uh, I guess, different genres. I shoot weddings, portraits, fashion, boudoir, and lately been obsessed with photographing performers. So, yeah, I've noticed that. I've noticed that on your Instagram that you've been uh, working with a lot of Vegas performers. Obviously, you know, unfortunately, they've been out of work. And what's what's the story behind that? I mean, what what made you pivot, or did they come to you? I mean, what's what's been the deal with the Vegas performers? Yeah, it's funny. One thing I didn't realize about coming to Vegas, although it's sort of obvious when you think about it, but um, I think we have one of the best creative cultures in, in the world because there's about 350 shows a night in Vegas, obviously not now, but in its, in its, uh, in its peak, so to speak, in non-COVID times. So when you think of the performers, when you think of the dancers, uh, uh, lighting people, production people, like everything one to do with the entertainment industry, it's a very small, close-knit, incredible creative community. Now, now, I didn't really come for that per se. I, I just got sick of LA. I got sick of the traffic. Um, I felt that I wanted to be in, in a hub that I could travel easily, get in and out of it very easily. I love the music culture. So if you want to have fun, you go on the strip. If you don't, you come off it. And ironically enough, I'm not really known as a wedding photographer here in Vegas. Uh, people know me as a portrait fashion and uh, portrait fashion photographer. And uh, what happened last year, I was um, – uh, approached by a production company that we did some commercial work for. And he said, would you like to be involved in a project and, and contribute to a project called Nothing But A Mask? And I'm like, well, tell me more. And they said, well, obviously, you know, performers are the, are, are the, are the backbone of, of the Las Vegas community because without entertainers, Vegas is just a, another city with a few more lights and a few more casinos. So you take the backbone away, it really has lost its soul. So he basically said, you know, we want to feature performers wearing nothing but a mask. And I'm like, I go, you got to be careful with that scenario because even though performers are happy and comfortable and, and, and empowers people to look at, to look and celebrate beautiful bodies who've committed their whole life to a certain craft and, 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 and physical perfection and all that kind of stuff. I said, but it's also Sin City. So you got to be careful. It can, it can go south and trashy very quickly. I said, I don't want to just contribute. I would like to spearhead this project. And basically, it's develop awareness for entertainers and also hopefully raise money for performers and so on. And obviously, because there's so many out of work, uh, getting access to them is a lot easier. So people that I've been in awe of and, you know, when you watch Cirque du Soleil performers, for example, wear body paint and they almost look inhuman. And then you realize they're just normal people like the rest of us. They've got families, they've got bills to pay, and they've developed their whole life perfecting certain skills mm -hmm. and i'd say by i mean i've photographed probably 35 performers in the last year and it's addicting i think it'll be a love affair that i carry on for the rest of my life so it's been exhilarating and motivating in many many ways yeah, yeah that's interesting yeah, yeah. that's cool I, I, what if what's the one cool thing you've learned from these entertainers i mean is there something like that, that you could peel back the curtains for us and you know, any any crazy things that, that they go through, uh, you know, I know they've got a pretty grueling schedule uh, during peak season, like you mentioned. Any other cool things that you've kind of learned about these folks? 
Yeah, I mean, a few things. So I, I, I certainly have, I mean, I'm, I'm a very empathetic person. So there's a certainly more empathy uh, that goes to the performers because you look at these performers and you think they must be getting paid several thousand dollars per night. And it's just not true. Some of them get, barely get paid a hundred bucks to perform a night. Wow. And it, even the marquee performers get paid reasonably well, but nowhere near, let's say, a master of one's craft in a different industry. So and, if, and the money that they do make, they put towards their nutrition and their bodies and fitness and everything. So I guess it's the it's it's really cool to see a fellow artist in a different genre so committed to excellence because I myself have devoted, I mean, since I was 15 as a hobbyist and then 20 since a, as a professional, I'm now 47 and I still feel like a baby in the industry because there is just so much to learn. And so when you look at these performers, they generally choose one craft, like whether it's aerial or whether it's ballet, uh, whether it's an, a certain apparatus, and they just perfect it and they're masters at it. But then as I'm photographing them, I'm like, oh my God, there's a killer shot. It's incredible. And I'll show them the photograph and they'll be in awe very quickly. But they're like, oh, do you see my toe? It's got to be like this. And <laughs> my hand have yeah. to, has to be like this and the feet have to be curled and all these different things. So the collaborative effort, I think, for me has been exhilarating, and you know, I guess I'm 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 sort of trying to find my equal in different genres. I'm not saying I'm the master in photography, although I, you know, I feel like I, I I'm certainly sort of right up there with experience. But when it comes to these entertainers, I feel like they're so far advanced in their craft, and it just makes me want to be a better photographer and and a better person. So. It's yeah, it's been amazing. I, I think, like I said, I, I'm going to make it a hopefully my goal with this project, apart from raising money for the artists in many, many different ways. But I would love to do a book and I'd love to do an exhibition because I think, see, wedding photography, it's not like I can sell it as art. No one's going to buy someone else's wedding photograph unless they're famous or dead or both. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so because no one would you, you wouldn't have anyone else's wedding photograph on your wall unless it's of a. Uh, an extremely well-known photographer like a Leibovitz or whatever, or, or uh, again, of someone famous, but that's just not what we do. But you would buy a print of a, of a fine art nude, or you would buy a print of, of an entertainer, a performer, or perhaps a, a landscape. So, you know, at the moment I'm focusing on the, I guess that's, that's, this is just it. For me, it's reinforced my, one of my life's mottos, and that is focus on the process, not the result. So, Everyone is after perfection. Or everyone is after that win, and I'm just, I'm just putting one foot in front of the other and just having a freaking grand, grand old time doing it. Sure. What the result may be, if I don't reach it, I'll be disappointed. But if I'm exhilarated by the process, I'll always win. Yeah. So you know. Yeah, and you're learning. It sounds like you're learning a lot while you're going along, and you know, I, I'm sure some of the the people who do dance photography who are watching or listening to this you know, are probably, you know, nodding their heads because I've done a little bit of dance photography and, you know, you show the, the images to the, uh, to the dancer and they say, oh, yeah, my toe is not proper position. You know, they, they've been taught for so many years, you know, what's proper yeah, and they want it. Perfectionism. Well, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And they, they, they don't want their dance teacher uh, seeing those photos and saying, you're not in proper first position, or <laughs> you know, second position or whatever the case may be. Um, well, that's, that's really interesting. And I'm glad that you found some new, um, maybe I'll call it a challenge, you know, during this time. And uh, everybody's kind yeah. of pivoting in some capacity, whether their business is pivoting, um, you know, whether they're taking on different types of work. And so that's, that's really interesting to kind of hear your, your point of view. Now, are you still doing weddings then? I am. Um, look, last year I had like, I'd say 12 to 15 booked. Um, I shot a couple at the start of the year and then everyone else canceled and postponed. Sure. Then I had six in six weeks in October, September, October. And then some were mask all day, every day or all, all day. Some were like COVID doesn't exist. And even though I heard conversations uh, at night, people getting drunk, don't get the vaccine because little robots will track your every move. <laughs> I'm like, you mean like Facebook and Twitter and TikTok and Instagram that already does that? <laughs> right. right. So, so, you know, so then that happened. And then now um, I haven't 
shot any weddings so far this year, but I've got one next month. I've got one the following month. I've got another one in the two months. So things are opening up. Um, that being said, I've had lots of portraits actually because people are knowing uh, knowing me for my my service and what I do for portraits because, you know, I don't just, you know, in and out in half an hour. It's a, it's a whole experience. So often I'll pick someone from the um, either from the airport or their hotel, you know, they get their hair and makeup done. If it's a heterosexual couple, the girl might be doing the makeup. I might be photographing the guy. The girl can see um, we have these uh, cameras on because we film mostly all of our stuff for education. So then the partner can see what I'm photographing inside the different room, which is awesome. So they're getting warmed up to the experience and watching their partner getting photographed. And by the time the nerves get cut out, because usually guys are a bit more nervous in front of the camera, now they're all warmed up. We get some strawberries, we get some cheese, whatever we do. Then uh, she gets photographed. And as a couple, we do all these variations. And even sometimes, um, because I, I, without even realizing it, I've become a professional stylist because I style all my shoots. And I've got literally dozens of racks of clothes that you could come in and I've probably got a look that you need um, for whatever basically reason. So I style all my shoots. Um, we, we have this great experience. So people have been flying to me um, for the experience. And I haven't really advertised it, but it's somehow sort of grown into this little thing. And half of my clients are, are photographers. So, you know, and that's that's very humbling because you get photographers who don't spoil themselves. And I preach to photographers, you, you need to understand what it's like to be spoiled and what it's like to be photographed. And then also you can tell a story to your clients that I practice what I preach and I hired a professional that I respected and I admired who created something flattering and meaningful and therefore everyone wins. So that's been, that's been really, really fun and really cool. And even lately it's been amazing because I've, I've um, added a lot of filmmaking to what I do. So Jason, who works for me is a filmmaker and uh, we've just pushed each other to sort of do some more stuff. And I shot my first music video. Um, I directed my first music video only about a month or so ago that led to a documentary of the singer and we're doing the second music video on Saturday. So wow. it's, uh, it's really cool. Like things are, things are, you know, just pivoting and expanding and the tentacles are spreading, so to speak. Sure. Well, that's, <laughs> I, I think it is humbling to have other photographers visit you, whether they're on, uh, you know, a spot, a spy mission to see how they should be running a photo <laughs> shoot or, or not. Um, I still think that would be quite humbling and, and, you know, I'm sure you get a kick out of just shooting, shooting the shit and just talking business with them. You know, it's fun. I, I, I sort of remind them like you're not a today. You're not a photographer. Um, you, you're just a couple in love or you're a family, you know, with you know similar values or whatever it may be. So and in, yeah, I'd say probably over a third of my my weddings are also photographers as well. So it's uh, it's really yeah, it's really nice. You know, uh, for me, I I'm careful not to put all my eggs in one basket. Uh, in a sense that, I mean, if I was only a wedding photographer, I wouldn't have survived um, in the last year. You know, I mean, I would have survived, but it just would have been a lot tougher. I would have had to do all these things. And, but, you know, everyone has suffered the past year. There's no doubt. I mean, every, most industries have suffered, but, you know, I guess I don't spend time on things I can't control. I spend time on things that I can't. So let's let's ask you a question. I think with with weddings kind of coming back, it seems like, you know, people are getting vaccinated. I think, you know, we're, we're closer to, to returning to normalcy than we ever have been. Um, you know, what are some advice you have for, for photographers, maybe specifically wedding photographers, maybe people that have been out of work for a year? Would it be to diversify or is now the time to really kind of perfect your, your wedding, wedding work? I mean, any, any tips that maybe you would have for photographers listening? Well, look, so let's face it. So, I mean, right now, obviously, you know, podcasts get listened to, obviously, even years after the fact. So, Right now, we're in March, you know, 2021. The vaccine is already being rolled out in different countries. Some not. Um, some countries just don't think it exists still. So we're in this weird time. I think that what a lot of photographers have done, they've absorbed and watched a lot of Hulu and Netflix and <laughs> Amazon Prime, and they're boasting about how many seasons of a certain show they've devoured. And I'm like, well, you should be boasting about how many times that, you know, have you re-looked at your website? Have you added to your website? Have you actually added SEO? Have you redone your price list? Have you, you know, gotten work that you can during these difficult times? Have you diversified to pet photography? Have you diversified to doing social media for your local strip mall, even for 50 bucks a week, doing, you know, 10 posts a week and 
doing you know fifty dollar uh, or hundred dollar a week services for different industries because everyone's not doing what they should be doing on social media. Um, I think that there'll be people who'll be kicking themselves and saying, I wasted that whole year waiting behind the computer, waiting for the work to come in, where people like me, I mean, in my life, I have been hungry. I have, I, you know, I, I literally was waiting for my next meal in parts of my life. I never wanted that feeling ever again. So I've often told people in the industry, pretend like you're going hungry because maybe one day you will be. So those people who put all their eggs in one basket, as in the wedding basket, and then events can't happen anymore, we wouldn't have fathomed that this would be humanly possible. But the same way that the, the, the iPhone, the smartphone, the smart device have affected, you know, less photographers being hired, you know, it was already that our industry sort of shrinking um, in certain aspects, at least in the wedding industry. So if you didn't expand into portraits or newborns or children or whatever it may be, then you're going to be suffering. So I think just we have to be smart. Too many photographers only see themselves as an artist and not and and find no art in business. But there's so much creativity in business, they just can't flick the switch. I mean, Brandon, you know me. I, I've I you know I'm a I'm probably an entrepreneur number one. I mean, I'm I'm probably an artist number two. But in entrepreneurialism, if you want to call it that, there is artistry in in entre, you know in entrepreneurship. So. You know, I think people just have to understand that. And really, and I think I encourage photographers too, that they should consider themselves a business person in photography rather than a photographer in business. Makes you think differently. And what, how I became successful and how I've maintained my longevity is I spent a lot of time in my life, especially in the early years, that one day a week, I was always on the road, as I call it. I was always developing relationships, manifesting new ones, and, uh, you know, building reputation and a brand loyalty and longevity and you know it, it comes back but too many people are just they pedal on that exercise bike so to speak and now they take their foot off and it's still turning and it's like oh i've got to come back to it i've got to come back to it you know um so you don't just establish relationships you have to maintain and manifest them and and that's that's the important part of it yeah i think you bring up a good point i mean a lot of people he said the business plan right and i think a lot of people will just love taking photos, you know, maybe they're artists, they feel they're artists, they want to create, you know, beautiful images, and they can produce beautiful images, but they don't know a lick about business, and they don't know how they're going to market themselves, they don't know, they don't even know how they're going to invoice, you You know, it comes to, to payment, they don't even know how to prepare an invoice for, for the client. Um, so I think that's interesting, I think that in general is, is a great tip for anybody listening that wants to get into photography, you know, a business course is probably more valuable to them than a photography course, uh, if, if I had to guess. So, yeah, no, that's, that's, that's very yeah. interesting. hundred percent. The best analogy that I can give, and this, this analogy normally wakes up people, is that too many people treat their businesses like a diet. So let's say, you know, literally last year, people want some comfort food and they, you know, we still, we all gather a few pounds and, we feel comfort in in in, in shitty, tasty food, <laughs> um, or a lot of the the good foods, and then all of a sudden we find out ourselves unhealthy. We're not moving as well. We're you know we're not looking as good, not feeling as good. So then we got to go on a diet. So then we we work out. We 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 have our vitamins. We drink more water. All that stuff. We're feeling good, and then we think, okay, you know what? I can afford to have that Shake Shack. I can afford to have that burger, whatever it may be. And then we're back to where we started. So metaphorically in business, when we are suffering, now whether it's a pandemic or whether it's our own d doing, whether it's just some circumstantial thing in business, you need to, you know, need to pedal a little bit harder. Um, what happens is that we are we reactive. We we feel like metaphorically we need to go on a diet, so we exercise and do what's right for our businesses. Then when we're healthy, when money's coming in and cash flows in, then we just slow down again. So. And most of us can identify with that because very few people look in the mirror and say, I wouldn't change a thing. I'm completely healthy and I'll die in my sleep when I'm 100. It just doesn't work like that. So what we have to do is don't consider it a, a diet, but a lifestyle choice. This is the way I eat now. This is the way I exercise now. Or this is what I do for my business every day. So working on your business and in your business are two very separate things. So, you know, that's why I've never done my own Photoshop. And people say, what? I've known you my whole life and my career and I can't believe you do your own Photoshop, whatever. I'm like, well, 
50 hours a week, if I said to you, find a client, maximize clients, you know, your profits, market your business for those 50 hours, tell me you wouldn't make enough money to pay for Photoshop and make more money and be more profitable. And then they, they agree. But then they, I'm a perfectionist, so therefore I'll keep on doing my own Photoshop. And, you know, you should only really do things that only you can do. It's as simple as that, you know. Yeah. So how do you find then the balance of not burning out, I guess, your passion for photography? I mean, I know that you said you keep it very consistent, but. Well, it's, it's a push and pull. If I did, I mean, early in my career, I was shooting 100 weddings a year. My studio was shooting 300 weddings a year. Um, if I shot 100 weddings a year right now, I'd, I I'd probably wouldn't be alive. I mean, I've got, I'm literally got a, wearing a brace right now. <laughs> I've got, I had, I had one herniation in my back um for the longest time that caused me back issues and then i like lately i've been like oh something's not right here did an mri recently and i only i forget this the the thoracic i don't know what there's the upper neck and there's a lower back and then there's a middle i just did the up the neck and the back i've got five herniations and and last week i literally just couldn't walk so <laughs> when i when i talk about analogies a lot of it's often true right where like i've been trying to get on an even keel to to get myself healthy. Um, and I know you were talking about more mentally and spiritually, I guess, but I just wanted to bring up the physicality of it too. If I was to give advice to someone back at, you know, a photographer just starting or early in their career, I would say, make sure you stretch every day, make sure you have a, an exercise routine that will ex you know, because we're often leaning forward, we're squatting down, we're lying down, we're lifting things up and we've got to do that the right way. So first of all, that's an important one, but how do I stay motivated is, I do a lot of personal shoots. So if I, you know, want to photograph something, um, if I have to wait to be commissioned to photograph the way I want to photograph, i will probably still be waiting by the door. So I remember like in 2016, I said to Melissa, I could, I could see myself burning out where I was going to probably, I wouldn't have quit photography, but I, I was going to quit teaching because most of my life is about giving my energy to other people. And I love teaching, but I'm like, I felt myself just burning out. And then I said to her, July and August, I don't want to shoot any weddings. I don't want to do any teaching engagements. Just, just book me nothing, nothing that that I have to do. You had speaker burnout. I, I know many I people do. who who have gone through the same thing. That speaker burnout. Right. So I'm like, because I, I mean, this is the thing though that there's people have. I mean, Brandon, you've seen teachers come and go. Many. I, you, I, I've been doing it for 20, 20, teaching for 21 years. So I can't think of many that are still doing it let it at the rate that I've been doing it for this longest time. I, I don't think I can, I can pick anybody. Everyone has sort of dropped off and fallen off and newbies come in, they realize that they've screwed their work. And so I've, I've found this balance, but cut a long story short that year in those two months, I developed an entire new body of work and it was all fashion portrait driven. And then I, I remember that year in, in Australia, we have the AIPP, our Institute of Professional Photography in Australia. And Every year you submit four photographs into a particular category or genre. And I've always entered wedding and I entered fashion for the first time. I ended up winning the Australian Fashion Photographer of the Year. Now, I'm not saying this to boast, but it was a symbol of my commitment. And again, it was the process of, of doing that and reinventing myself. And then the result, it wasn't the award. The result was I had this whole entire body of work that people didn't know that I could do. And I couldn't care less about photographers knowing. It was... I could do it. I could do it for other people and clients. And then that developed onto more boudoir work that developed onto a lot of fashion work, um, doing campaigns for Nikon and now this performer based work. So it's been, that really, really helped redefine and reinvent myself as I do all like every second, third year, I'm always doing something and expanding. And that really, really, um, helped my career. So for me, it's some people are photographers. I, I I'm, I'm a chess player. I'm just, pushing back, pushing forward, pulling back, pushing forward. Um, uh, I, you know, sometimes I get sick of myself, so I've got to pull back. <laughs> and you might see me go three months of not doing any social media. And sometimes it's purely for my mental health. Sure. And also I want people to miss me. It's like, oh, you haven't been Jerry for a while. <laughs> Holy shit. And all of a sudden all this work comes out. Oh my God. This no So, you know, for me, I don't care about being popular. I care about being here in 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> I well, care about being here in 20, you know? You bring up a great point, Jerry. I think a lot of people are, gosh, you're, 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 you're hitting a lot of, lot of points that I want to talk about because um, you talked about that edu educator burnout. That's one. I think that's really important uh, to not 
consistently do education because then, you know, if you, if all you do is education, then, you know, you're not a photographer anymore. You're an educator, right? And so I think there is that, that mix that you need to have. I think a lot of educators are also scared to do a brain dump uh, of all the tips and tricks they've learned um, because they feel like, oh, now they're going to have a, a, a look like, you know, Jerry Guionis has and, and what's that, where's that going to leave me, right? However, I always tell this, and, and, and Joel Grimes, a great friend of mine, uh, he'll actually be on the show here, here in a couple weeks, um, actually mentioned this to me. He said, I don't care. He goes, I don't care about sharing all my secrets. And the reason I know I can share all my secrets is because I know I'm going to outwork them. And he'll tell you that to your face. Yeah. He'll tell you everything he knows, and then he'll tell you, I'm going to do it about 10,000 hours more than you will. <laughs> you can do it for 50,000 hours. I'll do it for 60,000 hours. And I know that by the time I get sick of it, like Jerry just alluded to, I'll be into the next thing. I'm going to kind of try something different. Yeah. You know, when everybody's running my direction, I'm going to be running in a different direction. And I think that's what – uh, you know, some of the best photographers in the world all have in common is, is they perfect their craft. And then they say, all right, I've done that. I feel like I've mastered that. Maybe I'm getting a little bit bored with that. I want to go do something else that's going to actually challenge me. So I think that's really interesting you say that. I love that thought. Yeah. I mean, look, Joel, I, he's, a, he's a great friend of mine. I got so much respect for him. He, he's, uh, he's just, he just loves his craft. I mean, uh, he's stayed here with Amy a couple of times and We've just talked photography the whole day, and we gave ourselves permission to just to just talk about the craft. And and he, like me, I'm just like a child in a in a in a in a, in a playground where 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 I'm where I'm just having some fun. And I, I just play dress up Barbie, like, and I love it. It's fun, you know. So so I, I guess this is it that that no one can be you better than you. And I think all of us, we when we're starting off photography, we lack confidence because we're not good enough. We're not good enough. I'm like, well. Well, put it this way. We all suck when we start. That's just a fact. We all get better with every shoot. That's also a fact. And the fact is also that if you're putting your work online or on Instagram and you've done that in good faith and people book you in good faith, then the least you will do or should do is at least meet expectations and then obviously work your ass off to exceed them. As far as you know, educators, I think too many people are trying to get famous and popular just by teaching like be, prematurely and it's hard because i mean you know someone like me i've you know i make a lot you know half probably half of my living probably a bit less than a half or whatever on on education but i've made it a serious enterprise in a sense that i give value for the wisdom and information that i'm giving but i've also learned shortcuts on how to teach things in a quick fun and efficient kind of a way but so too many people go get it in the in the wrong way they want to get popular and it's it's purely a popularity contest they want to be popular and have likes and have you know and have those extra hearts and all that kind of stuff where if you are forfeiting what's got you to a point where you think you can educate as in that's just your hardcore business and everyday turnover and cash flow hopefully then all of a sudden let me share those secrets well you're going to take time away and it's so diluted now that everyone's a teacher and I'm like, well, yeah, you know, I'll just stick to my guns, do what I do. And, you know, things will, people will come and go, but the, the hardest worker in the room is always going to beat the, the genius who's lazy. <laughs> you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know? Yep. Absolutely. And that's yeah. the, the, the 10,000 hour rule. You know, you put that 10,000 hours into anything, you'll, you'll be an expert. And I, I firmly believe that. And I think, I think you do Definitely. too. Definitely. Jerry, let's let's shift gears a little bit. You know, you you. How many years have you been a wedding photographer? Twenty seven. Twenty seven years, yeah. Okay, so you have a few stories for us, right? <laughs> I've got endless stories. Endless. <laughs> I want to know. I want to know three things. The the best wedding you've ever shot, maybe the favorite wedding you've ever shot, and I'll, I'm going to read all three, and then I'll let you kind of uh, go into them. The most scared you've ever been during a photo shoot for during a wedding yep um and what should the third one be olivia happiest he's ever been the most proud he's ever been um the most scared he's been i kind of want to know what the worst would be 
Yeah. Well, the worst would be the worst, scariest could I, be. I can add some fun stuff to it too. What about the most, the most, um, I want to say sent, uh, emotional, the most emotional yeah, wedding okay. maybe you've ever photographed. Yeah. So I, I, I think emotional, I'll, I'll, I was going to, there's two weddings that have been my favorite, but when you split the question up like that, I'll leave the one of the two for the favorite and the, the other one for the most emotional i'd probably call it exhilarated so you know as okay. you know melissa and i got married over 10 years ago and um that's when we first you know when we were we just started the ice light the first version of the ice light sure sure um but when i photographed basically i photographed my own wedding or m most of it <laughs> so when I, I i woke up woke up the day of, of the wedding and melissa and i were in, you know we were living in an apartment and I did not want anyone else to photograph her or us before the wedding. So I ended up basically photographing um, her coverage. And I also photographed us in a mirror, um, probably long before selfies were really prominent or anything like that. Yeah. And so, you know, we, we had this beautiful big mirror. It was in a room overlooking the city with a piano in it. And uh, without being too personal, I did some really sexy shots with Melissa, some boudoir stuff and very sensual. It was just a, it was a very, I can't even tell you, it's a very beautiful, sexy, just raw, beautiful shoot. And that's the, I think it's the, it's, it was just beautiful to just look through the lens of my camera and see this incredible human being that I was going to spend the rest of my life with. So to, that was just a beautiful That's experience. Cute. It was beautiful. Um, so, yeah, I, I'd say that was the most exhilarated. And then we walked down now, the aisle Jerry, together after that. So, I have to interrupt you. Sure, please. I know all the ladies who are listening want to know <laughs> if you did any sensual doudoir selfies. There was the no, <laughs> there was no doudoir. Um, you know, doudoir. maybe an open shirt was as bad as as, as much as we. All right. <laughs> we, all right. All right. <laughs> We might have to get some of these, uh, you know, PG rated ones for the for the YouTube uh, edition of this, and maybe we'll we'll put that's those funny. up as as this is on. It's actually that's a funny story about that because I I often will do a seminar when I talk about shooting through the eyes of a loved one, and I I share a photograph that I took of Melissa, and she's fully nude but covering up her naughty bits, and I'm shooting in the mirror with a twin lens reflex camera, with with film, and you know I show the photograph. And I'm like, I'm, I'm not offended by nudity. I mean, if you're offended by nudity, you shouldn't be an artist. For God's sake, this is the, the most beautiful creation ever made by God. And, and I'm, I'm, of course, you know, be vulgar and stuff. But, you know, so if you're offended by that, that's just silly. But, but anyway, so I show that. But in the context of this seminar, it's a beautiful thing and it's not inappropriate. And people identify with it because we all love love. And then as, as the euphoria grows in the audience, I'll say, well, you know, now that you've seen my wife naked, can you send me a photo of your wife naked? <laughs> <So> <laughs> and, and no joke. How many of you people received? People have sent me <laughs> photographs of their wife naked. I'm like, dude, I was oh joking. Oh, my gosh. I'd, people coming up me after the seminar and showing me on their phone. I'm like, dude, like I was joking. Wow. And sometimes the <laughs> wife would be right there and very proud to show me. I'm like, yeah, it's getting awkward now. But uh, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> um, too but anyway, funny. that was the most Too exhilarated funny. that I've been. I'm shooting a wedding. Um, That's awesome. The probably the one of my favorites, probably right up there, was uh, oh, it probably is my favorite after behind my first behind my wedding, is the, a five day wedding in Rome. So the, the 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 anomaly is that people think that I shoot high end weddings, and I actually don't. Uh, people just have that impression of me because I have a a profile in the industry. But I've made my most of my living photographing normal people because I started with humble beginnings in Melbourne and you know I never promoted the award when I just was just doing the hard work. And I've just learned how to make more money from normal people. And so, but I'd say a handful of times in my career, I've done some big weddings. One of them was in this five this five-day wedding in Rome. So I get there thinking I'd have the day off before this wedding. And then the bride says, Hey, how do you how about you fly with us um, for the bachelorette party? we're having a full day in, in Barcelona. I'm like, okay. So there I'm in Barcelona <laughs> photographing the, the, the bachelorette party. Then we, we come back and every lunch and dinner becomes more extravagant than the next. And the, the ceremony was crazy uh, beautiful. Uh, if, actually, if you go to jerryguionisphotography.com, one of the first photographs you'll see the flower arrangements and all that kind of stuff uh, on there. But um, 
it was beautiful. Even one dinner we went to, um, Leonardo DiCaprio was sitting behind me. <laughs> it, it was it was just weird. And that was when he was uh, doing, uh, what, what movie was it? I think Inception. I can't remember. Um, anyway, and then even the night of the wedding, we had five ballerinas flying over from Romania. I did this sort of very classic shot with the ballerinas. It's part, part of my sort of my legacy folio. And then the day after the wedding, they had this romantic um, Valentine's Day red party. It was crazy. So a lot of iconic shots came from my early career from that wedding. And consequently, that couple invited us back to the Vatican to photograph the christening of their baby at the Vatican. So they flew us back to Rome um, to do that as well. So Sounds I was just like hoping... just ordinary people to me. Yeah. It was, I was hoping that they would... Uh, apparently one day in every year, the Pope himself actually christens babies. And I think the couple forfeited that chance because we couldn't make it to get married you know, at the Vatican, but by not the Pope, by somebody else. Wow, but, well, you're I more just... important than the Pope. Well, so... Uh, that's what that was a running joke for for that day. But um, I was just hoping to be there when the Pope was there because I wanted to sneeze in front of him, um, so so he could bless me. But <laughs> but anyway, so now the only the you, scaredest I've been at a wedding. The it, it, it's I'll try to make it quick, but it's it's a tough one. So I photographed the wedding of this family. Grew like just fell in love with this family. Beautiful family. Um, then I shoot the brother's wedding. So then I'm shooting the, the groom's coverage of the second wedding family. Oh my God. You know, like everything was, you know, the, 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 the romance behind it because we knew each other and we we're going to bring out the best in them. We was more meaningful. Anyway, I get to the bride's home and the energy was completely different. Like it was so, I, I, I can't even, you know, like when you walk in a room and someone's had a fight and that cling wrap just enraptures your face and you can't breathe. It just felt terrible. Anyway, there I'm photographing the bride next to the window. And I, I say a joke, like one of my early jokes that everyone used to giggle at. I take a photo of the bride, show her in the back of the camera. I said, oh, there's one for my wallet. I'll do one for you now. And then they should giggles and I'm, you know, I'm flirting in a respectful way, whatever. Now the father hears that and he says, hey, that's my daughter. I'm like, ha ha. You know, when you don't know whether he's joking or not and you do sure. that little giggle, he sure. wasn't joking. I'm like, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to offend. Just having fun. Great. So now I know my limit. Don't joke. Knowing you end up. limit's pretty nothing. low. <laughs> nothing. And normally I'm really good at finding where that line is because people who know me, I'm, I'm cheeky. I, I, I'm Greek, Australian, American. You add all that together, I'm, I'm a cheeky guy. Um, you know, cheeky boy. Um, so, <laughs> so, so anyway, so now... During that bride's coverage, one by one, the mother, the father, the sister came up to me saying, Jerry, I think you should photograph there. That's a better spot. I think you should photograph there. That's a good spot. So they were like, and I'm trying to grip my teeth. Like, yeah, I understand. It's all about the light. Just trust me. It's better to have good light on you and a plain location rather than something extravagant and light because it won't be flattering. And I'm trying to educate them, but, but they were just control. The whole family were control freaks still with really bad energy. Anyway, so I grip my teeth, I bear it, no problem. You know, sometimes I, I, I remind myself I find it more fun to, to take money from people that I don't like. <laughs> so I'm like, okay. So I shoot the wedding. It was a Lebanese Orthodox wedding or something. Across the road from this church was the park. So anyway, all the family there, like this, about 100 people waiting for a family photograph. I set the couple up. And then I'm, you know, I get them ready. And then I'm like, one by one, boom, 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 boom. The father comes up to me, says, don't you think it'd be a good idea to photograph the family first? I'm like, and then the mother came, said the exact same thing. I said, guys, I'm setting up the couple so the family can come in. I've done this once or twice. Just pretend like I know what I'm doing. All I want is just a little bit of respect. He jumps in my face I've never seen a man so angry. I've never, I've never been confronted like that, jumping in my face, threatening to punch me. Then the brother gets between us, pushes us away from each other, as if I'm going to knock out the the bride's father. <laughs> but you know that, you know that awkward feeling when you're in danger and you get, you sort of get that butterflies and tingling and and that that sense of you know that fight or flight type of thing. And I'm like, oh, Jerry, you you can't, you can't 
do anything. Just take it like a man, you know? It was like, like it was to the point where everyone was trying to control the day and no respect whatsoever. And I said it in a joking way, but it obviously triggered him. It's almost like they were photographers. Anyway, <laughs> they wanted to control. It must their... <laughs> I don't know what the hell was going on. But anyway, so we finally, they come down. I said, guys, like the whole day you've been telling me what to do. You've hired me for my expertise. I've photographed the brother of the groom's wedding. This is why you booked me. You know, I know a thing or two. Just let me do my thing. I apologize if I offended you in any way. Let's just get to it. So there I am. The father's in that first family shot after he jumps in my face and everyone witnessed what happened. So I'm like, I'm just trying to pretend like nothing happened and I'm smiling and uh, like, you know, doing my thing. Anyway, back then I did it. And to this day, I do a lot of same day slideshows where I basically photographed the, the wedding day during the reception, pick my favorites, present a slideshow and then present it at night. Now that wedding, I only, I lived in the city and I basically just photographed the cutting of the cake, went home, did the slideshow, came back. I was avoiding the father when I came back to the reception. Anyway, set up the projector, powerful music, put the slideshow together, played it, tears, cheers, applause, whatever. I'm packing up the gear to just run out of the reception. And then there I see the dad just running towards me. I'm like, oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> He's, his whole physiology changed. He was so almost like he went from the Hulk that he was during the day to this broken, humble man. And he said, that was the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Um, I just want to thank you. I'm sorry about treating you what the way I did today. My brother died two months ago. His dying wish was that the wedding go ahead, hmm. but I took it out on you. I'm sorry. Wow. He started crying. He hugged me. I started crying. <laughs> And I'm like, dude, I thought this was my last wedding on earth. Um, so that was clearly That's the powerful. Uh, That's powerful. clearly yeah. the um, the most the toughest wedding that I've done. The well, funniest thing uh, it goes many to funny, show fun you never know what somebody else is going through too. I think you know whether you're at the supermarket, whether you're you know anywhere in life, you know you treat people with respect because you don't know what they're going through, and and I think that that story kind of proves that. Yeah, I mean, you yeah. probably still charge them triple the price, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I he mean, stayed yeah, for the yeah. rest of the reception. Yeah. He got bonus photos. Well, I, <laughs> I, I, I still walked away while the going is good, but yeah, yeah. I remember, so the funny, one of the funniest things that have happened at a wedding. I so I did a wedding, I did a same day slideshow, and as I was packing up, the bride comes up to me in the middle of a dance floor. And as she was walking towards me, as I was, you know, packing up the wires, because normally the projectors in the middle of a dance floor, projecting on a portable screen that I used to bring, she comes up to me, and you know when someone comes up to you and, and brings out their hands, like I want to hold hands, so I'm like, okay, so I grab her hands. She walks up to me, and she's like, I'm, I'm a tall, I'm six foot two. She's like five five, and she's staring up at me like this, and then she says, I can't believe that was me. And she looks at me and she closes her eyes, leaning forward to kiss me on her tippy toes. I'm like, what is happening right now? I don't know. I don't know what to do. I'm like, I don't know. Do I turn the cheek? Is she going to be offended? Is there some cultural thing that I don't know about in this? Is that, have I missed something here? If I, like, if I, you know, am I going to offend her? If I kiss her back, is it too much? What do I do? So I, do I that, use tongue or not tongue? Yeah, do I use tongue? Like what, what, <laughs> what's going on? So I'm like, all right, if I'll just stay there, if you, if you kiss me on the lips, I'll just, you just do what you do. And I'll, I'll just be a black canvas. <laughs> <laughs> no shit. She came up to me. There was no tongue, but it wasn't like she was kissing her mother-in-law. It wasn't like this. It was like a, And I'm like, for those people, and then she, audio she only, off, you need to watch on YouTube to see Jerry's uh, yeah, like, making out with this. Well, I have, I mean, I've, I've <laughs> yeah, been told go with the I've, mic? I've got nice big lips here, but um, <laughs> sorry to interrupt. <laughs> no, no, no. It, but my whole life, like I was in front of me, like, oh, what do I do now? When she, and then when she kissed, she sort of, she came off and she slowly opened up her, it was like from a movie. And it was so freaking awkward. And I'm like, well, shit, do I, like, am I going to look around? Like, who's going to be walking at me? Is, is the groom going to knock me out? All I know is that's what happened. I sheepishly took everything away. So so she how did she preface the album it? And get... what, were, what were the words she said to you before then? No, I, I can't believe that was me. 
Like, in and other then, words, I brought out the best in her, you know? Okay. And then did she say anything after the kiss? I, I just, I, I couldn't speak to her. Even now, I'm, <laughs> just I'm walks out. Speak. <laughs> Jerry, back, back Jerry then. blacked out for 20 minutes after saying, what the hell just happened? And... Wow, that's so a, I mean, that's my, my, my first wife, I I went back and I I, I admitted that night that I committed lip adultery. <laughs> it, uh, <laughs> she well, laughed at it and all that stuff, but yeah, you know, geez. that was it. Wow. Well, <laughs> certainly those are just a few stories, but I'm sure you've got a, a lifetime of stories. You could probably write a book just on well, not a single photo, just on, <laughs> on stories that you've Some seen. Some brides and, kissing him. Brides kissing brides, brides kissing. Well, I mean, from that day so onwards, no, sure no bride thanking cool. me ever measured up, and now I'm just yeah. ready for a, a big sloppy wet kiss, but no one's, no one's going there, and and now you know, now everyone's sensitive and all that kind of stuff too. I'm like, you know, I gotta, you know, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta maybe just maybe regulate my my thanking to a good spooning <laughs> or something like that. You know? <laughs> Oh well, yeah. I think uh, I'm. I'm sure you'll you'll think of an appropriate way, and maybe <laughs> Melissa will be involved too. <laughs> well, oh, awesome. Man, it's funny. Well, Jerry, it's been a pleasure. Um, I guess anything else? I think we've we've learned a lot, Jerry. Where where can people find you if people want to learn more about you? Where can people uh, locate you? What what social media are you maybe most active on when you're not taking a a two month hibernation or, or whatnot? <laughs> so um, probably the easiest way to find me is uh, go to my Instagram um, at Jerry Giona. So J E R R Y G H I O N I S. And the link in my bio is a shortcut to lots of ways that you can learn from me and about me. So whether you want to see my wedding and portrait folio, whether you want to see my fashion editorial, whether you, uh, there's a, a couple of free goodies there as well. So if you want to get some free tutorials from me, you can download them. So you'll see the word free. Um, there's workshops there. There's online training. I mean, you know me, I'm, I'm, I'm involved in a bunch of things and certainly, uh, you know, what we're doing right now as well, I'm excited about, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. it's all good. Nudge, nudge, wink, wink. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Jerry, we appreciate having you. Uh, we need to have you back, honestly, probably season two, season three, uh, because there are so many stories. I feel like this past 45 minutes has gone so quickly. Um, and I know you've got many more stories to share and many more stories to come. So uh, with that said, we'll see you guys next week. Thanks so much. 